Welcome to Global Impacts and we're looking at stage three of the product life cycle of a garment, the fabric and textile production. So if we go to our overall product life cycle, we'll see that we started with conceptualization a couple of weeks ago where we looked at um, where the design team should be located. Then last week we had a look at the raw materials that we could we could use and we focused predominantly on cotton and some of the consequences or costs associated both socially and, and environmentally with using cotton. And so now we're at the first stage of the transformation of that raw material to send it on its way to make a particular garment. And it's probably one of the most challenging stages in that there's not many options for innovation in this field, although not so much as there are in other fields. So always remember, we're doing it in the context of our two systems, the ecological system or natural capital, where we ask ourselves, if we are to spin a fibre, what impact does it have on the natural world, on our environment? And on the other side, on the social systems, if we do spin a fibre, what impact does it have on people's lives, both negative and positive? And of course, our two models, Planetary Boundary by Johan Rockström and Kate Raworth's Donut Economics, or Social Economy if you like, are the frameworks that help explore this topic. So I'll start with a little video on the fourth industrial revolution just to give us um, a bit of context in terms of the application of technology in fashion. We, we, don't, we know technology is going to play a more predominant role in the fashion industry, but we don't quite know in which direction it's going to go or what role it's going to play. So as product developers, as merchandisers, we need to be abreast of um, those technological changes. So let's have a look at what this fourth industrial revolution is mountains that the world was first introduced to the phrase the fourth industrial revolution and it's been a hot topic among academics politicians and business leaders ever since but what exactly does it mean the term fourth industrial revolution was coined by the founder of the world economic forum a former professor named klaus schwab Schwab wrote a book with that title to describe an era marked by a technological revolution that is blurring the lines between the physical, digital, and biological spheres. Let's break that down. Technologies like artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, or the Internet of Things are becoming ingrained in our day-to-day -day lives and even our bodies. Think of voice-activated virtual assistants, face ID recognition, or healthcare sensors. Schwab first presented his vision of the fourth industrial revolution at the World Economic Forum's annual meeting meeting here in Davos in 2016. But to understand the idea, we need to go much further back in history to Industrial Revolution number one. The first Industrial Revolution started in Great Britain around 1760 and spread to Europe and North America through the early 1800s. It was powered by a major invention, the steam engine. The result? New manufacturing processes, the creation of factories, and a booming textiles industry. From the late 1800s, the second industrial revolution was marked by mass production and new industries like steel, oil, and electricity. The light bulb, telephone, and internal combustion engine were a few of the major inventions of this era. The third industrial revolution, sometimes known as the digital revolution, occurred in the second half of the 20th century. In just a few decades, we saw the invention of the semiconductor, personal computer, and the internet. So what separates the fourth industrial revolution from the third? Experts say the main difference is that technology is merging more and more with humans' lives and that technological change is happening faster than ever. Consider this, it took 75 years for 100 million users to adopt the telephone. Instagram signed up 100 million users in just two years, while Pokemon Go caught that amount in one month. 3D printing is just one example of fast-paced technology in the fourth industrial revolution. The industry has gone from a business idea to big business, with 3D printer shipments expected to increase from just under 200,000 in 2015 to 2.4 million in 2020. Today, you can have a hip replacement from a 3D printed bone or use a 3D printed bionic arm. Talk about blurring the line between humans and technology, right? 
This new era of technology is driving a lot of innovation. You can see in this chart the number of patents related to the fourth industrial revolution for things like 3D printing or AI has been climbing up and up since early 2000. Organizations are embracing new technologies to make their businesses more efficient, similar to how they embraced the steam engine during the first industrial revolution. But some companies and governments are struggling to keep up with the fast pace of technological change. Research shows innovators, investors, and shareholders benefit the most from innovation. The risk is that the fourth industrial revolution is making inequality, which is already a big issue, even worse. One study found billionaires have driven almost 80% of the 40 main breakthrough innovations over the last 40 years. That's a problem when the richest 1% of households already own nearly half of the world's wealth. Experts warn we are in a winner-takes-all economy, where high-skilled workers are rewarded with high pay and the rest of workers are left out. Studies confirm technologies like AI will eliminate some jobs and create demand for new skills that many workers don't have. Privacy concerns are another issue, as the fourth industrial revolution turns every company into a tech company. Industries from food to retail to banking are going digital, and they're collecting a lot more data about their customers along the way. Users are starting to worry that companies know too much about their private digital lives. The World Economic Forum says a majority of leaders don't have confidence their organizations are ready for the changes associated with the fourth industrial revolution. With tech changing fast every day, it's time to catch up. Hey everyone, Elizabeth here in Davos, Okay, so um, as you can see, there's a lot of information in there that uh, needs to be considered. But what it means, once again, as I said a couple of weeks ago, you've got to keep your mind open to what fashion and product development and merchandising will mean in the 21st century. It could be something um, as diverse as people making their own clothes at home using 3D printers to drone deliveries, uh, to recycle products, who knows? Uh, but certainly we're in an era of great change at the moment. So with the Tri Project, you learn the traditional way of product development and merchandising, still the, the, the main mainstay of the industry. However, we need to keep abreast of what's happening as we go forward. Okay, when it comes to the actual um, production of textiles, there's a number of stages that we go through. We're going to assume we're using cotton, so it's going to vary depending on which material you use. But you may have covered this in materials last year, but basically we gin, we gin the, um, the staple and then either card or comb or both and then spin it and we've got our finished um, fabric at the other end. So we're going to look at the, the environmental and social consequences of doing this. As it stands in the industry, it's done by machines. This is highly efficient, as you can see by this image here. If you had to do that by hand, it would take an enormous amount of labor to do so. So machineries do it, they do it, they do it extremely well. Uh, however, with the use of any machine, there is demand for electricity. And most of that electricity at the moment comes from burning coal, and we know the consequences of that in terms of CO2 emissions and climate change in Johan Rockström's planetary boundaries. So if we were to look at it, we'd be asking ourselves, is there a more efficient way to spin yarn or at least generate electricity from a different source? So we're going to just explain, I'll explain these processes, uh, starting with ginning. As you can see, it's a separation of the seed from the fibre. So you've got to remove all of the unwanted material before you can start spinning it. We take the fibres and then we use it to create the yarn. The byproduct, and that term itself, byproduct, meaning as if it's not important or of lesser importance, is perhaps a traditional term and we should um, treat it more as another product, are the seeds. And those seeds can be used for um, the creation of food and cosmetics, food for animal feed certainly, uh, cotton seed meal, livestock food and fertilizer. Uh, and the hulls, the outside of the seed, can be used for food as well. So when we demand yarn, we're also creating a demand or we're also creating the supply of food 
for animals and people as well as cosmetics. So from a marketing point of view, we could actually incorporate those beneficial elements into our selling point that you know we've created a garment made from cotton but at the same time we've created fertilizer that can be used for the production of more cotton later on to do that you need to have transparency in your supply chain and understand where that fertilizer go and how it's applied so it's again looking at the process holistically not just focusing in on the yarn and saying oh, I don't really don't care what happens with the other material oh, sorry I had a, a video of this for you as well just have a look at the process here. it's pretty pretty simple where are we this is a manual one obviously not machine but the cotton goes in and gets put through this sort of um, rolling pin where the seed the gap isn't big enough for the seed to flow through on the other side it drops down on the left hand side and uh, lost him and the cotton uh, sorry not the cotton uh, the cotton goes through to the other end yes it is cotton not sophisticated relatively simple to do so our first process is a simple process again if it was a machine it would require electricity and the question would be where does that electricity come from uh, the cotton gin waste if you like again another term to suggest it's not important to us but it still is a valuable product um, or gin trash as it's called can yield high levels of nitrogen and trace amounts of phosphorus and potassium and if you recall um, those three are combined are also called fertilizer equally the gin waste can be used uh, can be pelletized so there's some companies that will actually get all that waste and turn it into small pellets and use them in either special heaters where they can burn it efficiently or just burn it like a, a, a stick or a piece of wood remembering that um, there's some two and a half billion people in the world today that only cook by lighting a fire they don't have gas or electricity as a as an option and that those two uh, many of those 2.5 billion actually live in places where they grow cotton so there's a certain synergy there if we do source from a country a developing country and we do uh, purchase their cotton then perhaps we add a little bit more value or invest in the supply chain that generates um, these palletized fuel from the gin waste as well again closing the loop or finding a source so that's both environmental and socially beneficial to both